So as he said, you know, I'm one of the ag engineers, and we're, and we're trying, in addition to Morgan, and, you know, we're trying to figure out, you know, what's a better way to potentially put up our fencing system. So what do we have available to us now? What's available to us in the future? And where do we go from here? So think about innovations. You know, if, if there be an easy way, the easiest way to potentially do it is just hire somebody else to do it. But it, it's probably like anything else nowadays. It's really hard to get anybody to show up to do any work. So, you know, I was having fence done this winter. When it was so, so cold, I was out there putting up fence because I couldn't get somebody to come out there to do it. So that's just how the world is right now. So we have to do a lot of this stuff ourselves, it seems. So, you know, there is no quick, easy solution. You know, we just have to get out there and do it. But I will talk about, you know, what, what are the current technologies for mapping, monitoring, and potentially tracking our animals and potentially in, in our system here. And then think about, you know, what, what can we have in the future potentially, thinking about virtual fencing and other technologies we can use as far as monitoring our fence lines and trying to effectively manage our operation. So what do we have available to us? Think about online mapping tools. So what's available to us right now? So quick and, quick and easy, it's Google Maps is going to be one. Kentucky Base Map, I have a website listed there. And then the Ag Site Assessment Tool. So these should be in, I think, um, in, your, in your binders as well. I forget which section it is. Yep, New Tech, the New Tech tab. So it should be in that tab, and it'll have that, that website there. You know, Kentucky Base Maps is one, I think. It's an online tool. It's going to be very, very, very useful to you. And I'm going to talk about all the options we have available to us. So, you know, quick and easy, what we can first use, you know, one of the, one of the one of the systems I use uh, sometimes is probably Google Maps. And so what we can do is, especially when I'm doing farm visits, because for farm visits, I'll come out to, I'm supposed to be coming out to Madison County, and they'll say, well, go down by the red barn, turn right, and then, then you take the next left by the big tree. And so there's a lot of uh, stuff they know that's very, very familiar to them, but not familiar to me. But what is unrefutable is uh, a lot of times I get latitude and longitude. So if we right click on a Google Google Maps will actually give us an option that says what's here, and if we click on that, it'll give us latitude and longitude. So I can, and then you can send that to me, and I know exactly which barn I'm supposed to go to uh, if, we're, if we're doing a, a barn evaluation, facility evaluation. So it's really helpful for me, sometimes the agents, for knowing exactly where to go. So that's one tool we can utilize. The other aspect is it does have a measure distance. So at the bottom there, it does have a measure distance option when you right click. We can click on that and then you can go around your fence line and figure out how much distance you have. And so then if you close it, it'll actually give you the total area in square feet. So this is about 10 acres here. We actually convert that from square feet to acres. And so we can do that calculation. So that's one quick, easy way. If I'm using Google Maps or Google, Google Maps, I can get some distance. But as soon as I click off though, I lose that area calculation. It goes back to distance. I've used this for waterways, fence line. You know, it gets you within about 50 to 100 feet. So it's good, quick estimation. How many posts do I need? How much wire do I need? Quick, easy estimation tool. And so the con, uh, you know, the pros are it's quick, easy. The cons are we can't really save it. You know, we, once we, and we can only do one field at a time. So that's one of the main limitations. We can only do really one field evaluation at a time. That takes us to Kentucky base maps. So Kentucky base maps, I use, you know, especially this time of year, I have a couple maps just printed out so I can just go out in there and figure out, you know, how many acres I'm going to spread for fertilizer potentially this year. So fertilizer, at least they want you to buy it this year. Last year, they didn't want you to buy any fertilizer with the pricing. But, uh, you know, you go into Kentucky base maps, that website, and so you can select, you know, you select a polygon tool. You can select to show your measurements, so area in acres and feet. So you have a lot of different options here. But then you go through and you highlight around whichever field you're looking at. And it gives you your acres, so 24 acres and about 4,000 foot of fence. So I can get this printed out. And it's a little easier to see when you actually are looking at the screen. But Kentucky Base Maps is a good tool because you can also, and I can create another field. So this one's going to be purple. I can color code things a little bit and get multiple fields to print out and figure out, okay, well, this field's 16 acres, that one's 20 acres. I can go through my entire farm and just figure out, you know, what's the size of my fields, how much fertilizer do I need to have, whatever it may be, how much fence line do I need to have, how much fence line am I, am I potentially looking at as well. So quick, easy option, do multiple fields. 
I really like this tool. It's just an online, quick, easy tool. So, you know, the cons is, you know, it's quick, easy, area, different colors, different shapes, you can print it out. But the limitation is we can't really export any in shape files or KML or KMZ files. So we can't necessarily, we can't save it, but it's quick and easy to use. And it's, again, another online tool that we have available to us. Another online tool is the Ag Site Assessment Tool. So the Ag Site Assessment Tool is also very useful. It provides a lot more data for us. And so when we're thinking about this, if I'm looking to maybe purchase a property, I just want a general information on a property, this would be a very good tool, potentially. Because I can get the area, centroid, the huck summary, 12 digit huck stream, water bodies, wetlands, uh, and my soil productivity, my soil types, environmental climate, and so whatever is taking place in that area, I just get a general overview. So if I'm new to the area, this is definitely a tool that I'm gonna be thinking about using. So we have a, a lot of people coming from out west, and so it seems like this would be good for them to at least figure out what they're getting into. Um, and, and so, like I said, it gives you that latitude, longitude, tells your area, total potentially intermittent stream length, per persistent stream length, so it gives you some of that hydraulic, if you're interested in that. From an engineering standpoint, it gives you some of that just basic information as well. Uh, and then it also has your temperature. So this is where you have that soil data. So it gives you kind of percentage or breakdown of that, what that total area, as far as what you're looking at, how much is good, going to be good, bad, and, uh, you know, potentially questionable. And like I said, it also gives you windrow. So it's good. Yes. So it should be on, online. It'll be online. And you should be able to either Google search for Ag Site Assessment Tool, and I think it's through the, um, Missouri, I believe, or Mississippi. I can't remember which university it is. Oh, Missouri. So it should be, it's on, it should be on the third slide or so. And so it's the Ag Site Assessment Tool, and it should be through, um, Missouri, University of Missouri Extension. So, but it, it is another, another tool to give you just a lot of just general information on the farm. And another, Neat aspect. So we can get uh, with that one as well. So it gives us a wind rose. Wind rose, you can break it down by month. I think it's only over about 15 years, but usually wind rose is about 30 years. But this still gives you some decent idea of what to, what to kind of expect for that. Uh, so again, you go through, you highlight your area of interest. You go through and you get your geographic coordinate system. So it gives you that if you want, if you're interested in that potential elevation as well. But I do like the fact that we can also put a line across there. We can put a line across, measure path, gives us potential elevation. So if I'm looking at, you know, before I get boots on the ground, trying to figure out what kind of elevation. So we got some hills around here as well. You know, what kind of elevation change am I seeing? Uh, and it, it'll be a rough estimate. So it, usually these are based upon like either DEMs for your digital elevation models, so they're about 10 meters. So it's definitely smoothed out. So it could be a little steeper, but it gives you a general idea of what's taking place on the ground that you could be interested in. And maybe how you, some considerations for if you were trying to try to fence that. Also as well, so we can get area as well. So this one, it's free, has a lot of information on it. So it's another powerful tool. However, you know, the cons, we can't save or export files. So these are all good online tools for quick, easy access to some information. We draw or border around whatever field we're interested in and then utilize that. One that is, that we can save information is, is Google Earth Pro. It's free, free to download, and the online, there is an online version, but the one you download, in my mind, is more useful. It's just a little more, fun, has a little more functionality. And so with this, we can save files, we can save files, so we can have them permanently, so we can save the two main file types, KML or KMZ, KMZ just gives you more information. So now I can embed pictures and other stuff into my files as well. So this is a quick, easy tool. And it's, it's very beneficial because, you know, we, we mainly have kind of three types that we put points in there. So maybe each one of these points is what, is what Dr. Hayes has done with her, uh, put out her waterers, marked her water line, so walked her water line with a GPS unit. And so we're able to track them. And now she has a GPS track for her water line that you can potentially export as well. So, and all the fences as well. So the length of the fences, the breakdown, different colors. So this one's being, can feed three different fields. So just giving that information, because sometimes 
you know, uh, I like to have or at least keep track of some of that historical knowledge because granddaddy might know where every water line is and every, every little hazard that might be under the ground, but a lot of us, you know, we come on, you know, five, ten years later and we don't know where anything is. And so it would be good to kind of keep track or at least at some point mark down, you know, where are at least the water lines? Where are they? Where's, where's my underground hazards? Potentially, so that'd be something good to track if you get granddaddy and walk a line, even with a cell phone. Like, just, just got to get a basic GPS track for this. So, you know, some options we can get our fence lines and kind of get a breakdown. Other neat aspect is we can actually organize these. So we can actually organize by folders. So a lot of times, just producers, you can organize by farms. So if I have my Brown Road farm, my Alfred Road farm, or, or this section, you can organize folders and keep all the individual fields by farms as well. So. And then if you want to oops, right click on any of one of those folders or file or fields, you can export it. So you can export it to your ag agent, you export it to specialists and say, I have this field, how do I subdivide it? Where do I put my water? So it gives a lot more detail to them because we can visualize ahead of time, try to figure out, okay, what do we think we have going on here before we get boots on the ground? So it can be a powerful tool for them as well to share some data and, and uh, information. And then we can also save some information. So in, in those files, we actually save, you know, if we want to put my, some of my soil data from past years, you can put that in there as well. So it's got a little section where we can put some data in there as well. If I want to save my tons of lime, pH, acres, whatever it may be, that can all be in there as well. So very, very powerful tool. Uh, and yeah, like I said, you can also put the KMZ files, you can put the images. So I had one where, uh, here's my water line coming here approximately, and then my, Richie water that froze up. You know, so that's what we can do as far as our mapping. So with regard to monitoring, so monitoring is going to be a very, very important aspect as well. So I say here, you know, livestock are aggressive poker player. And they, and they are. They will call your bluff every time if they think that fence is off. So they, they'll call your bluff every time. They're going to be out there checking it, making sure you're keeping it hot. So we have to make sure to keep it hot. And you know, I remember as a kid going through there and the dad would tell me to test the fence so you go get a blade of grass and go get a little zap as well. So there are, you know, much better tools that we have now. So get you some type of monitor, whether it's, you know, you're looking for your voltage or your fault finder, which will tell you where your fault is. These are very, very powerful tools. Just get one. I know they're going to cost some money. Which one do you like? But just get you one of these. And there are much, much more, you know, there's much, you know, we have much more options than we did in the past because there are ones you can actually have where you, your Gallagher box, your box can actually, you can turn off your fence while you're in the middle of the field. You can check your fence voltage with your phone on some of the, with some of these boxes. So there are a lot of options. You know, they're going to cost a little more money, but there are some more options that give us a little more flexibility as far as what we can do as far as monitoring. But definitely get you some type of fault finder or checker if you're going to be running any type of electric fit, electrical fence. And then, you know, thinking about what are our other options, you know, one of the things we can have is, is, is drones. So these are very, very potentially powerful tools that we can utilize as well. Uh, we do have to have license for these. So we have to take a knowledge, or we need to take a knowledge test because we're going to be used it for commercial purposes. But uh, so that knowledge test is about, it was $150, now it's $175 to take. And, you know, UAVs must be registered with the FAA, and that's $5. And we have to think, make sure the airspace we're going to fly. Most places we're fine. You know, the one place I would be concerned about around here is, so, you know, around Lexington, we have to be concerned about, you know, mainly towered airports, the Bluegrass Airport. But, you know, around here, I'd just be concerned about the Bluegrass Army Depot. So making sure I'm not in their airspace. That'd be my only concern around here. Otherwise, you should be fine. If you're, if you're not close to that, you're probably fine. <laughs> So we use, we use these before for checking cattle, you know, at the UK farms, checking cattle's waterers, feed pans, checking the animals in the field. Uh, if you fly, for the most part, what we saw was if we're flying above 30 feet, and this, we did it with beef cattle, so it wasn't like we were cheating and using dairy cows. But we did it with beef cattle. If you're flying above 30 feet above ground level, they really don't care. They didn't, you know, at some point they might take off the first time, but if you fly enough, they just, they do not care. You get down above 15 feet above ground level, they start to get concerned and start moving on you. But if you're flying at, at 30 feet and above, didn't really seem to phase them at all. And so we use these a lot of times. There is damage along fence lines. We can set up dedicated flight paths. 
and we're looking for, you know, wind damage, anything to happen to our fence lines. You know, this was at, we had a wind event in the Woodford County Farm, and so it was knocking down trees all, all across the line. So we just able to really quick go out there and assess, yeah, we definitely have some issues right after the wind event took place. So that can be, you know, these things can fly, but you can legally go up to about 400 feet above ground level, and then go up to, I think most commercially available ones go about 45 miles an hour. So I can see, if I fly up to 400 feet, look straight down, I can see about five acres. Now granted, the calves, cows at that point look like ants, but you know, it gives you a powerful visualization tool where I can fly at 45 miles an hour as a crow flies, you can cover a lot of ground. And it helps you avoid these too. So when you're checking cows, I can just fly over the gates and fly clear to the back, of the back 40. And it also helps you avoid potentially, you know, some mud issues. So this year wasn't as bad as past years. But, you know, we can send them out there dedicated waypoints. And waypoints are just X, Y, Z coordinates. Uh, well, latitudes, longitude, and elevation. And we can send out there and, you know, we don't have to necessarily get in that mud. But there's obviously, for this, was, this was solved with uh, feeding pads. But, you know, we can go out there and maybe if we have mobility problems, this can be a way for us to overcome them and still check the animals. And they actually have some of the remote controllers uh, on the drone. So the Phantom 4, I think, had it where you could put an HDMI, and some of the newer ones as well just have a built-in HDMI cable. So you can connect that HDMI connected to your TV and we'll see pretty much whatever the drone is seeing, you can see. And, and a, a near live stream. So that can be kind of helpful too. But you're supposed to maintain visual line of sight with the drone, but that's, that can be an option for you to just think about. And so, you know, this one I can fly from this location about here to the back 40 in the 70 acre farm in less than a minute. And up there, the cows are going to be back here. I'm flying about 400 feet above ground level. So it can be, there's the cows. I know exactly where to go if I'm going to go looking for them. And so a lot of times if we do have cows get out, we're trying to use these. You can't see through trees, but that would be where you maybe need a thermal camera. We haven't, we haven't tested that out yet, see if it actually works for trying to see through the trees to find the cows. But, uh, you know, there are apps, so Drone Harmony is one, um, Air Data, or, uh, DJI Ground Station Pro is what you would need if you have Apple. So, but these are just ways we can set up waypoint camera angles and fly around our fence line. So the black dot is actually the orientation of the camera, and we can pretty much visualize our fence line, set up a dedicated flight path for looking at fence lines. So that could be an option for us as well. So they're easy to update, you know, we have different options throughout there, but we can, lots of... Uh, variables we can set up either on the map, but what I actually like to do is I actually just go out there, hit record on my flight paths for those apps, fly it, and then just say, okay, save that flight path, and then I'll, I'll mod might modify it a little bit, but I'll save that and just refly it every time. So this is my check boundary fences, check interior fences. So I have different flight paths with different goals in mind. So in this case, you know, we can see what the camera will be seeing potentially at that angle. And so it does give you overall, like your flight path, so it'll be about 4,000 foot of fence, taking a bunch of images. We can take images, video, whatever you want to do, you can, you can do it with the drone. So there are some that are fairly easy to use. Uh, the one here I got is the um, DJI Mini, so it's fairly small. Pretty much, it can almost fit in your pocket. And it'll fly about 10, 15 minutes, then come back to you. And so for that, but I, this one will fly is about, I think, max speed about 35 miles an hour. Some of your big ones will go about 45 almost 50. So you can, you can definitely get some versatility. When I'm actually doing the fence line inspection, I'll fly at about uh, maybe 7 to 10 miles an hour, depending, and just fly along that fence line. If I'm looking at electric fence, I might fly, if I'm looking at single strand fencing, I'll definitely fly a little lower and put some ribbon on it, because it makes it a little bit easier to see. So I can look for that ribbon. So I'll definitely fly about 20 foot above ground level at that point, and probably 20 foot off it, so I can get a little bit of angle, not directly over it. And if we're thinking about, you know, what else is in the future, so what Gal you know, Gallagher has and the E Shepherd collar, this is another thing that they've hopefully come to come out here uh, maybe this fall as well. So they have it over in New Zealand. They've been using it over in New Zealand. You'll see a couple different versions of these out west. But what this is is where we have a cow's wearing a GPS collar. The GPS collar has a solar panel on, a little solar panel on top of the collar. So it's, it's pulling in, so that's this power source. It's pulling in GPS data and making sure to keep that cow within a pre-specified area and communicating with the base station to make sure that cow is staying exactly where she needs to be. So it's fairly useful out west, 
uh, and be used for potentially interior fencing, I think, maybe East Kentucky and on some farms as well. But, you know, this is something that could be happening in the future. That collar, if the cow starts going out of her specified area, it'll beep. It's almost like a big dog collar. It'll beep and tell them, okay, you're, you're going to the wrong area. And then it'll give them a little encouragement, you know, electrical encouragement to turn back and go the other way if she keeps going. So this is something we could see in the future. Gallagher's been working on this and, you know, really, uh, the pa you know, probably past even four years, I think the technology has even improved for this because we're trying to just make it more miniaturized, more consolidated, a little bit lighter for the cow, and, but still be effective for a management tool. And, and so this is something definitely taking place, you know, being utilized. They're wanting to utilize these out west a lot because we have that big, expansive area and you can really designate animals to a certain portion, but it could be uh, valuable to us out here. So that's something that could be coming in the future as well. And then also, you know, what we've done, some research at the University of Kentucky is, you know, looking for facial recognition. So doing our typical tracking and trying to figure out, you know, for these, I always said, which one of these different, one of these animals is not like the other. So we're doing some facial recognition. You know, the cow can cover their face with mud, technically, but uh, the, the tag, as always we said, is a, uh, it is a temporary identification form. And so we're trying to use machine learning aspects to identify animals. And really it's just the image quality. So within a day, we can predict animals with about 90% accuracy. Between days, it can be 90, uh, may, can drop down at about 10 identif uh, percent identification. So really it's just that angle of contrast and we're trying to use it on Angus because we said well, that's, we want to actually make it useful. Otherwise it's just looking for the pattern on the dairy cow. So we want it to be useful for most of the beef herd. So we're still trying to resolve some issues with that. But that, you know, I'd like to open up for any questions. Oh, and I do, will say, you know, talking about current technologies, I did want to mention this. So I, you know, Morgan and I have done, a, we do a lot of fencing, it seems like. And so the amount of fencing I do, I should have the arms the size of Popeyes. But, or forearms the size of Popeyes, but I don't because I end up buying one of these. And it saves you a lot of time and a lot of stress. You know, you, there's a couple different versions of this, but you know, it's, it's a really, really powerful tool. Uh, and pretty much I can go through a fence, put this on there, and as, soon, as fast as I can count, I can put a steeple in. I can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, boom. I'm moving on to the next one. Because it was, uh, you know, this was, we go out there and start fencing, it would be a whole, the whole entire family out there. Everybody would have, you know, five or six of us out there steepling, you know, hammering, doing what we could. You know, now it's, you know, myself and my brother. So it's now it's gone down to two people, a much more streamlined version. It's because we can do so much with this. And I, I take a hammer out there, but the hammer is almost decoration because I, I primarily just stick to this. And it just saves you so much time and so much labor. You know, and, and this battery will probably get me about 300 foot of fence. So I got a couple of that batteries. I'll do a 300 foot, put it on the charger, do another switch it out and put another charger on there. So I'll just go through and it's, it's fairly, let me see here. And then pretty much it's pulled up and it's ready to go. So as soon as you heard that's pulled up, I pretty much can go through one, two, and it's got a quick fire mode, single fire mode. They have a lot of different options available to you, but I think, you know, this, this is an investment, but I decided, you know, I, I've talked to a couple guys, either they said, I'm, I'm too old for this kind of stuff, but I need some, a tool like this. Or if you're young, you're like I got a lot of years ahead of me, it'd be really, really nice to have a tool like this, you know, to use, utilize for a couple years. So, or several years. So I'm definitely, you know, I've had this probably five years or so. It's been a, a fair number of years, still utilizing, still functions fine. So I, I definitely encourage you, there's a lot, you know, there's lots available on the market. So, um, you know, not doesn't have to be DeWalt. But I'm just saying there are some available that are probably more appropriate for, you know, producers, I think. So if you're doing some, I'm not a co commercial guy per se as far as fencing, but although I go to Anderson County Farm Supply, they say I'm the number two, I buy the second most supplies. I'm right behind the commercial guys <laughs> as far as purchasing fence supplies. So, you know, this, this can be a, an effective tool and, and it's, it's something I allow, my wife uses it and it you know, doesn't have a lot of kickback, and it's a very, very functional tool. So having something like that can be effective. Yeah. It'll cost, so this one, uh, oh, it's a, oh, it's a, st a staple gun, or a staple gun, steeple gun. It's a nine gauge, 
it'll put the nine gauge steeples in there, class three galvanized steeples in there. And I usually use an inch and a half steeples on it. Yeah. So you can set, you can set the depth, or you can set the power that's going to put it in there. And so a lot of times I'll just have it set to the either number two if I'm putting in for the fixed not high tensile because I don't want to drive it all the way in there. I want to have a little bit of space for it to kind of slide back and forth. Uh, but yeah, you can set the power and you can set the depth as well. There are, there's adjustments for that. So the traditional steeple is going to run you about four cents. This will run you about eight cents. But you save, it, it's amazing how much time you can save. I mean, I can stretch 300 foot and then just walk through there and, and do it like it's nothing. I mean, it probably takes more time to just put the, I do it traditional way, so put the chain on there and wrap it around and pull it with a tractor, and it takes probably more time to do that than it does to actually go through there and just staple. So. We're going to demonstrate a staple done this afternoon. It'll be similar to this, but a little bit different in construction. Yep. And so, yeah, some type of, you know, it doesn't have to be this one, but they, they are a definitely a tool that's available to you, and I, I, I strongly encourage it, because it, it does take a little more steeples, I mean, a little more costlier steeples, but it, it's worth it in my mind, just the time it saves. And plus, you know, you're not fatigued at the end of the day. Oh, yes. Oh, so, so if you get from your, from your uh, county agent, so if you're here in, in Madison County, you get it from Brandon, and I just take whatever information I have, like however much it tells me I need per acre, I'll just put that in there. Unless, unless you share it with somebody else, they can't see it. Yeah, it's, it's on your desktop. So that, that, the Google Earth is on your desktop. So it's on your computer. Any other questions? So the cost of this one, uh, this was about uh, $800. Like I said, the steeple is going to be about $0.08, cents, but, you know, it's an investment. And so you spread that cost out over. I've used it on numerous fence lines, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's definitely worth it. When, when you see it this afternoon with the staple fence up, if, if you're doing, if you're just doing a little bit of fence, you'll pound with a hammer, but it, you're doing a lot of fence. It, I've got, I've gotten to the point, even when we had all that, those trees go down, and, and we've had all that wind the past couple of, I just take this out there, I take the hammer with me, but I've gotten, I've gotten lazy and I've gotten spoiled. I'll just take this out there with me and, and drive in. It won't work on a, a locust post per se, but I'll just like, I'll hit it in there, call it, call it good enough and keep on, usually I'm fixing fence, I got other problems, I got more fence to fix, so. I even take this with me on short jobs. But. Any other questions for Josh? Let's thank Josh for the first day.